Uh, I have. Um, hey, hey guys, we're live. We are live. Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions on a Sunday Mindset Sunday again with Lee Rand Hirschkorn. This week, part two, deconstruction of the supermind of Naval. How you doing, Lee Rand? Uh, doing great. How are you? Yeah, good. Do you want to give uh, while share to the groups? Do you want to just give the audience a little bit of background on what you've been up to this week, and then? Um, um, yeah, um, I've well, I've been unless it's all top secret. Yeah. <laughs> No, well, you know, I've been, I've been, um, you know, working a lot on my business. Um, I have a, a new product that I'm that I'm launching, so really working on that, working with, you know, on the listing copy, on the design. So we're working a lot within, within, uh, within the Amazon um, business uh, a lot, and then just really, you know, working on myself, um, doing, doing the things that uh, you kind of want to do every day, like exercise and meditation, spending some time with my family, um, and working a lot, working. Um, so thankfully we're in, we're in a, thankfully we are in an industry that allows us to keep working, um, e-commerce during, during this, uh, COVID and, you know, a lot of, um, there's a lot of opportunity coming because there are some products on Amazon right now that are like out of stock and, um, there's crazy demand for, it. and, uh, some of those products I'm trying to get in very, very quickly to uh, take advantage of that um, limited time frame. Um, I spent some time, I wanted to maybe before we break into Naval, yeah, uh, cool. spent some time this week also listening to, I've been, I've been following, um, I don't know if you know the name, Derek Sivers. Yes, um, yeah, uh, is CD Baby, I know him yeah. from the music industry. Yeah, yeah CD Baby, so he, yeah. he, uh, he launched CD Baby, it was kind of like a hobby and then became like a real business. He spent 10 years working on it and then I think sold it for, you know, um millions of dollars i think more more than eight figures yeah. um, is what he sold it for but he's like a really i've been following him for like the last year maybe he's really good has some really good like life philosophy he's got a podcast um mm -hmm. and one of the things that he that uh concept that he kind of spoke about uh that uh kind of resonated with me was that there are two types of happiness okay yeah. there is shallow happy and there's deep happy Okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I like to, I think it's good to have a little bit of both, but ultimately you want to get more out of life by focusing on the deep happy. So what's the difference? So shallow happy is when you eat the ice cream, right? Yeah. It make, makes you happy for that moment. Mm -hmm. deep, deep happy is being proud of yourself for not eating the ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so it's just a good concept to um, kind of think, right? Because ultimately long, long term, you're going to feel better if you need yeah. ice cream. I think it's also okay to um i think it's okay to also celebrate the wins you know there was a one night a couple weeks ago i just wanted to like um you know i felt like i had a uh, a reason to celebrate in a good moment and i have a coach and he's like listen go out tonight order whatever food you know i, I typically try to eat pretty healthy but like just celebrate eat whatever you want you know whatever so i ordered like sushi and french fries and whatever and, like i think it's good to do that uh, every once in a while, but I'm also happier to know that most of the time I don't do that. Yeah. Uh, so good concept to think about, um, shallow, happy and deep, happy, whether it's, you know, diving into Netflix and watching all day will probably make you shallow, happy, mm -hmm. but knowing that maybe on the weekend you worked on your business will probably make you deep, happy, uh, in the next few days. I was, I thought when you said it, you know, the first thing that sprung to my mind is, uh, is a, a connotation for it is shallow happy and deep happy taking a selfie with the filter uh -huh. and then without the filter there's exactly. the two ways of looking at the uh, paradox there just yeah. want to say a couple of hellos so morning to joe lee chapman or afternoon uh for lee elchin says hi gents so in says hi danny lee ran looking forward to more of the novel session nicola is with here question is here hello guys joe says morning all look forward to this every day thank you even if it's not live and i watch the replay but thank you great for uh gemma is watching Stuart is also watching here um what other things do you want to cover before we start taking a, a dive into naval again um well yeah so one other thing uh, i've been reading a book i think it was written in the early 1900s called the science of getting rich yeah. um and one of the things that is that resonated with me that I, I've kind of done some of this exercise, but I'm, I'm doing it again. And I would challenge people listening to, to do this is, um, I think a lot of us don't know what we really want. You know, yeah. like I think if you, and maybe it doesn't apply to the people, the people watching and listening here, maybe 
more tuned with this. I mean, if you're on Mindset Sunday, um, you might be more tuned. But if you ask like the average person on the street, right? Like, what do you want? Hmm. I don't know that they like that most people would, would really have an answer. Like, what do you want? I would say over 90% of the population don't know what, what they want. Because if they did, they wouldn't sit there and watch Netflix all day and, and not, you know, they yeah. just wouldn't do that kind of thing. They'd find something else to do that was their meaning, their passion, their goal. Yeah. You know? so. yeah. Yep. Um, and then I'll, I'll add in one more thing as I've been listening. So Derek Sivers has a podcast and he's he's been putting lately on his podcast um, some uh, some shows that he went on other people's shows and, and interviewed him. And somebody asked him about like his values and how do you like know what your values are? And he's like, I pay it pay attention a lot more to the things you do mm. than to the things you say you want to do, yeah. right? Like, um, so I have like a, an accountability sheet that I've been using. I'll, I'll show I'll show those on here that are watching on on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Basically, it's a, it's a sheet of like all the things I want to do every day. And I check the box and I want to do, there are seven things I want to do as long as I do three plus a day, like mm. it's a good day, right? So it's like exercise, meditation, spend time with my family, read, read, watch a training video, whatever it is. Um, and, you know, I, it's like I say I want to exercise, but if I don't do it, do I really value it, right? So I've kind of been kind of been telling myself that because I put on my sheet that I want to exercise, but if I didn't do it for two days, then do I really value, do I really want to exercise? Do I really value it? And that's how I've been kind of talking to myself about, doing the things that I want to doing the things that I want to do. Like if I say I want to do it and I don't actually do it, then I don't really want to do it. Yeah. Um, and um, it's a good way to think about some of the things you want to do. We all say we want to eat right and exercise and meditate and work on our business and do all that. But then we go watch Netflix for three hours. Then do you actually value that stuff or, or does it only sound good to you to say you want to do that stuff? Um, but talking to yourself like that might push you to actually do the stuff you know you want to do. Unfortunately, there are people in the world that are, that are talkers and then there are doers, but then that's what makes the world a colourful place, right? Yes. So yeah, if, we're all on, if we're all entrepreneurs, there'd be nothing, no space for anything left. We wouldn't yeah, have employees right. or anything, would we? So I yeah, there yeah. has to be some sort of semblance, some sort of balance there. Uh, Tiff says, good morning, gentlemen. Joe says, love the science of getting rich. Lee ran Hirschkorn. Mensor says, morning, guys. So shall we get to the genius yeah. brain that is Naval? Yeah, let me call yeah, it up. Yeah. Remember, we're doing this proper ghetto, so I point the phone at the microphone. So if anyone yep. can't hear that out there, just let me know, and uh, I'll adjust the uh, the settings. Okay, this one here. How about we do judgment is a decisive skill. You like that one? Yeah. Let's yep. give that a go. Let's go. The tweet storm is very abstract. It's deliberately meant to be broadly applicable to all kinds of different domains and disciplines and time periods and places. But sometimes it's hard to work without concrete example. So let's go concrete for a minute. Look at the real estate business. You could start at the bottom. Let's say you're a day laborer. You come in, you fix people's houses. You know, someone orders you around, tells you break that piece of rock, sand that piece of wood, put that thing over there. There's just all these menial jobs that go on a construction site. If you're working one of those jobs, unless you're a skilled trade, like say a carpenter or electrician, you don't really have specific knowledge. And even a carpenter or electrician is not that specific because other people can be trained how to do it. So you can be replaced. So you get paid your 15, 20, 25, 50. If you're really lucky, $75 an hour, but that's about it. You don't have any leverage other than from the tools that you're using. So if you're driving a bulldozer, that's better than doing it with your hands. So day labor in India makes a lot less because they have no tool leverage. You don't have much accountability. You're a faceless cog in the construction crew and the owner of the house or the buyer of the house doesn't know or care that you worked on it. One step up from that, you might have a contractor, like a general contractor who someone hires to come and fix and repair and build up their house. That general contractor is taking accountability, they're taking responsibility. So now if let's say they got paid $250,000 for the job, sorry, I'm using barrier prices, so maybe I'll go arrest the world prices, $100,000 for the job to fix up a house. And it actually costs the general contractor all said and done $70,000. Well, that contractor is going to pocket that remaining 30. So they got the upside, they got the equity, but they're also taking accountability and risk. So if the project runs over and there's losses, then they eat the losses. But you see, the, just the accountability gives them some form of additional potential income. And then they also have labor leverage because they have a bunch of people working for them. But it probably tops out right there. 
you can go one level above that and you can look at a property developer. This might be someone who is a contractor who did a bunch of houses, did a really good job, then decided to go into business for themselves. And they go around looking for beaten down properties that have potential. They buy them. They either raise money from investors, they're fronted themselves. They fix the place up and then they sell it for twice what they bought it for. Maybe they only put in 20% more. So it's a healthy profit. So now a developer like that takes on more accountability, has more risk. They have more specific knowledge because now you have to know which neighborhoods are worth buying in, which lots are actually good and which lots are bad, what makes or breaks a specific property. You have to imagine the finished house that's going to be there, even when the property itself might look really bad right now. So there's more specific knowledge. There's more accountability and risk. And now you also have capital leverage because you're also putting money into the project. But conceivably, you could buy you know, a piece of land or a broken down house for $200,000 and turn it into a million dollar mansion and pocket all the difference. One level beyond that might be a famous architect or a developer where just having your name on a property because you've done so many great properties increases its value. One level up from that, you might be a person who decides, well, I, I understand real estate and I now know enough of the dynamics of real estate that rather than just build and flip my own properties or improve my own properties, I'm going to be a massive developer. I'm going to build entire communities. Another person might say, I like that leverage, but I don't want to manage all these people. I want to do it more through capital. So I'm going to start a real estate investment trust. And that requires specific. What's your take on that? You know, the, the less, well, the lesson is that um, accountability, uh, hmm. accountability and specific knowledge are kind of like the real, the real leverage, right? Like, yeah. you know, if you're the, like he says, if you're the guy that's, just the one doing the work, then, you know, there's not that much accountability, nobody, any, you can easily be replaced, etc. But the more, the more specific knowledge you get on the more specific knowledge you get plus leverage together, yeah. the more the higher, the higher up you can go as far as like, uh, building wealth. Yeah. And it comes that I think that comes to mindset as well. It's the difference between like, I, I've got a friend, uh, who's been on the show before, He's completely, he's a former poker player, right? Mm -hmm. He's on his way to doing 100 million a year. He started in 2015 like others, but he's natural habitat for leverage and his removal of the risk gene that mm -hmm. he don't have means that he's part of the reason he got there because of the decisive action that he took and his mindset in order to, to yeah. attain those goals. Does that make sense? Because these, yeah. this, to me, that was about levering up. Like, when I was younger, when I was 16, I worked on the building site. Mm -hmm. So where I am now, I don't own the building site or the building firm or anything because I've changed industries. But, you know, right. you as you make the progression, you can go from being the laborer, which is an unskilled job, to the mm -hmm. carpenter that is on the building site is quite well paid in context to everything right. else. But it's when you become the investor in the product, in the, right. in the property developer, is when you reach that the top of the summit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then he talks about how to, how, you know, you just keep moving up right until you get to the point of just like you're just investing in real estate investment trusts and yep. you're you're using leverage and capital in order to to yep. attain a lot more wealth than being the guy at the bottom just doing the work with, with the tools. Yeah. Uh, play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Try that one. Yeah. yeah. He turned into TripAdvisor and Yelp, which Hold is on. where we should have done. We should have done more local reviews beginning. because there's more value. I think when you're being authentic, you don't really mind competition that much. Yeah, it pisses you off and it inspires some fear and jealousy and all the other emotions that come along with it. But also you don't really mind because you're more oriented towards the goal and the mission. And worst case, you get some ideas from them. And there's often ways to work with the competition in a positive way. And it ends up increasing the size of the market for you. Yeah, sometimes it depends on the nature of the business. Silicon Valley tech industry businesses tend to be winner take all, at least the good ones. And so when you see competition, it can make you fly into a rage because it really does endanger everything you've built. Whereas if I was opening a restaurant and a more interesting version of the same restaurant opens up in a different town, that's fantastic. I'm just going to lift from them what's working and drop what I can see that they have already figured out is not working. So it does depend to some extent on the nature of the business. That said, even the businesses that seem like that they are often direct competition, 
really aren't. They can end up adjacent or slightly different. You're one step away from a completely different business. And sometimes you need to take that one step and you're not going to be able to take it if you're busy fighting over a booby prize. Kind of you're playing a stupid game and you're going to win a stupid prize. It's not obvious right now because you're blinded by competition. But three years from now, it'll be obvious. To give a simple example, when I was first starting companies, one of my first ones was called Epinions, which was an online product review site for all the products out there that was independent of Amazon. And that space eventually turned into TripAdvisor and Yelp, which is where we should have gone. We should have done more local reviews because there's more value to having a review of a scarce item like in a local restaurant than it is of an item like a camera, which is going to have a thousand reviews on Amazon. But before we could get there, we got caught up in the whole comparison shopping game. And so we ended up merging with Deal Time, and we competed with my Simon and BizRate, which became Shopzilla and Price Grabber and Next Tag. You get the general gist. Let's switch that to Amazon sellers, yep. Me Too products. Yep. Let's talk about software companies in the space doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about people doing courses, you know, not talk about them and, and everything around them. But my point yep. is that there are levels of competition there. It's like what I found quite interesting for PPC agencies is that we can all go to PPC Congress and hang yep. out. Obviously, there's yep. healthy competition. Right. But but you see, like even with me, I bring what would be my competition. You could be my competition. Yep. You come on the show all the time. Right. And people will know, already know you have an agent. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, how absolutely. you look at stuff. And I think Me yeah. Too products become troublesome in where you burn so much negative energy looking at your competition. Some people may ethically want to take them out the game because they've jumped above them. Yeah. Um yeah, do you, do you think do you think Amazon is more like the first example that he was talking about with uh, winner take all, or do you think it's like the restaurant in the in the in the other town? Amazon, anything generally in tech is a winner's take all. Products on Amazon are not a winner takes all because there's a there's at least half a dozen products that are going to get a look in on the page. Right. right. Once you get to price, it trashes the market. But Facebook won social networking back in the day. When you think right. Bebo, Friendster, MySpace, no one can get near it, right? So they, they right. won the challenge. You've only got to look at uh, Uber, right? Who's their second? Lyft. Lyft. Did That's we talk it. about Lyft? No. Right. You know, yeah. I'm sure people use them, but when you've all you guys fly over to the UK, I mean, yeah. everyone pulls their phones out. Does anyone go, I'm going to get a Lyft? Because if they did, they'd want to go, right. you know, because it's yeah. Uber. Right, you don't think of number two. Yeah, uh, there's seven, no, uh, there's no Google number two. No, they're not. They take ninety percent right. of the market. Bing's like yeah. three, four, seven, you know, whatever percent. Yeah, yeah. So, but Amazon products, there, there are room. Courses, there's room. But how many, how many businesses? If you're doing email sequencing, for instance, mm-hmm. where is your point of differentiation there? Because none of them really work because you can't calculate the open rate properly because Amazon don't give you the tools in terms of the API. Right. Yeah, right. They can send them out, but they can't do right. that calculation of open rate because it's, right. it's impossible. Right. And then so how do you differentiate by, by other, other than like kind of turn it into an iPhone and a fridge stuck together? Do you, do you see what I mean? But yeah. Amazon sellers have an opportunity here um, to not to differentiate their products, and it's not always a zero-sum game. Sometimes it is, but yeah, yeah I, I agree. It's not, it's not a it's not a zero sum game. Sometimes you sometimes you do have sort of like one or two players that dominate that dominate a market, and then and then there's yeah. some depending on the on the market. But I I think what he what he says as far as like I, don't focus too much on your competitors, right? Like mm-hmm. focus focus on putting out a, a great product, um, mm-hmm. and and if there's a if there's a way for you to differentiate based on your authenticity then that's great so if you have a face to that product yeah. right then then that could be and and that's what i mean the really really successful brands have have more of a personality besides just right i mean we're talking about million dollar sellers and brands on amazon but the really successful the 10 million 20 million 30 million have that have me too type products yeah. they differentiate in other ways based on the authenticity and the you know i mean based on the authenticity and the um the other the other intangibles of the of the brand that you can't that are that are outside of the of the uh, of the product itself 
Yep. A uh, couple of comments come in. I'm loving the win the day and finding it a challenge to get five most important things done, but it helps to stop me from getting distracted with side shows. That is come from Owen. I think you you was the one who come with the win to win the day a few weeks back, wasn't it? Yes. Yep. And um, you know, one it's interesting. Um, I, I put up a post um, from the Val. He he put something on his Twitter uh, mm -hmm. recently where he wrote out here are the things that kind of like he focuses on or he says, he says fast, like fasting, right? Like yeah. fast, lift, sprint, stretch, and meditate, build, mm -hmm. sell, write, create, invest, and own, yeah. read, reflect, love, seek truth, and ignore society. Make these habits, say no to everything else, avoid debt, jail, addiction, disgrace, shortcuts, and the media. Relax, yeah. victory is assured. So kind of like some simple things to, simple, not so easy, but simple things to focus on to, uh, I have to win. I have to dig it out, but he goes mad at the press. It's like, look, these people in the press are trying to create a pedestal for themselves of indifference, yet yep. none of them's run a business. So why would you pay attention to a business hack who works as an employee who's never run a business on done payroll or whatever it is? Yeah. Um, also, Questy, hey, my follow Navi, and all the time, uh, wise and learned a lot from him. Michael says, hey, guys, have a good Sunday. Joe said, information plus strategy plus skill equal the go-to person. Uh, Tiffany says, what do you guys think about the correlation between an abundance mindset and not being too fearful of your competition? The correlation between an abundance mindset and not being too fearful of your competition. Um, yeah. They kind of go together, right? Mm. Not being fearful of your competition. If you have yeah. an abundance mindset, you're not going to be too fearful of the competition. But I think it's good to let competition kind of drive, you know, competition is good in a sense in terms of yeah, good for the market, right? It drives companies to, to produce more value for the end customer. Yeah. Um, from that perspective, it's um, it's it's really good. Um, by the way, there's a couple. I was reading Naval's um, like recent uh, tweets um, recently, uh, just uh, this morning. He's got some really good ones outside of this tweet storm. But I'm gonna read a couple of them, a few of them. Yeah. Um, he's got okay. He wrote. Uh, he's talking about the, the the COVID and the lockdown. So he goes, lockdown is rehab for society to break its addiction to unnecessary commuting for un unnecessary meetings. Um, he then he then says um, he then says um, um, he had one about um, he had one about the media like the media loving this lockdown right because of all the mm -hmm. eyes on the uh, oh now that the media has realized that coronavirus is the ultimate clickbait we're going to be locked down forever <laughs> <laughs> um, and then he had the lockdowns will lift once the white collars start losing their jobs right so it's kind of an interesting perspective on uh, on on what's going on I'm, I'm assuming um i'm assuming he's sounds like he's like for starting to open open things back up yeah, I mean, there's some, some, I mean, there's some interesting stuff out there where people are saying on lockdown, which is true, your immune system is compromised where you're not getting full spectrum vitamin D, sunlight, etc., and that you you could be weakening your immune system over a period of time where you've got artificial light, all that kind of stuff. But it's dangerous, the context of it. You've got to be careful of, like, people latching onto one thing because they're trying to get out of the house. There mm -hmm. is a reason behind lockdown, and I know there are people right. with theories out there that you shouldn't, but... If you go outside without a mask on in a crowded place, there is a possible chance if someone's got the virus that you could get it. There's not, you know, there's there's no rocket science behind yeah. that. But you there's know, all the other stuff, you know. Yeah, and you know, Danny, I, I, the more like I was talking to my wife this morning, and we think like we went to Hawaii in January, and um, um, my daughter, my daughter, as soon as like we got there, my daughter had a fever. You know, after the plane ride, like we're already like already thinking that. All of us may have already had it, you know. Yeah. Um, we won't know until we get antibody tested. But I think, I think first of all, I think it's been around since November or December in the U.S. And that a lot of us may have already had it, and we don't even necessarily uh, necessarily know. I had, I had like a a slight fever for a day or two and a cough. My wife mm -hmm. had for for a few days, like in early March. My daughter had this fever in January. Um, yeah. I just feel like a lot of us, uh, you know, my neighbor was telling me. Uh, I was talking across across the yards uh, yeah, uh, Friday, and my neighbor was telling me that uh, you know, in the beginning of March, he had like a fever for a week, 
uh, and a cough, and he's never had that before. But he called the doctor and like, hey, you really need to come in. They, you know, it was before anybody kind of knew of anything, and he thinks he had it. And like, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people actually think they they already had it. Um, yeah. So yeah, I I thought um thinking back i even kind of you know when you just running stuff out of your mind and you think yeah, yeah well in like from first, i think i mentioned from with you and it's chris davy he was in china i said i couldn't have had it even though i'd like laid up in bed with chest pains and cough and everything else from the first of january to the 12th i couldn't get out of bed and i just thought it's because we went to a local event at the local um village pub and someone mm -hmm. else had a chest infection in there and they picked it up being close proximity but chris davy said and I, i'm like because we were in china right i said yep. it can't be because china was too far away and he's saying no 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 dan like there were cases before that it just hadn't been yeah. popularized in the media yeah. if i've had it then i'll be and and it, and you can't get it again i'll be more than happy to say great i've had it because right. i want you know because i'm still hiding away with autoimmune disease because I, yeah. I want to avoid having it but i may have had it so you know i could have been out instead of being locked down for the last 42 days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um okay a couple of more questions here this one's slightly off this one's from guru stein have you uh, have any of you tried selling sex toys on amazon it's a hard category to sell and ranking it's a dirty business that is and it probably is a real hard category um, to sell in as well yeah i i um no, i've never sold in the category but i did have an assistant um who who before she worked for me worked for a company that that sold in that category and they did they did really really well mm -hmm. uh, i imagine that you need to use different you know, you, you can't, there, there's a few things that you, that are, that are difficult, right? You can't run ads. Um, so that's, that's difficult. So you gotta, you gotta have really good sort of ranking and listing page quality and all that outside of being able to run ads. And, um, you know, and if you're going to do any giveaways or whatever, you have to do it outside the means also of like running Facebook ads and, and things like that. So I think it's just yeah. a matter of being strategic. I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a huge market. Uh, yeah. And um, <laughs> yeah, um, all the connotations being dropped, we've said yeah. dirty. It's hard. It's and a it's, huge market. Yeah, it's a huge market. But I mean, look. I mean, think about it. Um, most people are buying sex toys or or, or adult products online, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're one. A lot of stores, a lot of brick and mortar stores don't carry it. And two, people there's a there's a negative social connotation with going somewhere and and buying it. So yeah. buying it online is uh, is how people do it. Um, and I would think. Listen, right now, retails are, retail is closed. People are home. It's probably probably seeing an uh, uh, an uptick. No, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I change the subject there. Andy Shields here says, "Afternoon, morning, gents. I think Ravi is a smart cookie. Cookie, sorry, which is obviously Navelle's brother. Yeah. Not unlike Perry Marshall's calculation around online businesses, which see a ninety-five-five splits between because of network effects." Yeah, and momentum impacts. Uh, keeping more questions here. Sorry, because I'm coming out. Is that, by the way, is that, is that his brother on the show? Um, that's that's with him, Ravi. Or I'm, no? I'm not sure if it's his brother, but he's got a brother called Ravi. Because there, there's some person who, in context, will ask Naval questions, doesn't he? Would you hear it on there? But it yeah, could be yeah. his brother. Uh, sorry. So here, because of network effects and momentum impacts, which comes from first mover and large capital advantages, what Navi's ref referencing is the stupid decision excerpt is commonly called the second order thinking which is a mental model that focuses your thinking two levels deep which allows you to focus on reframing the program the whole mental mo models approach is hugely important so so i think what andy i think what you're saying is talking about first order consequences and second order consequences which means how does how does the when you make a decision there's an immediate impact and then there's a longer term impact and thinking about the longer term impact is is i think what you're referring to um kind of like eating the ice cream the benefit of that in, in immediate decision is feeling good the long-term benefit is if you do that every day you're going to get fat and sick um so i think that and that's second order consequences i think that's what you're referring to but not uh not sure uh, Joe says, I've heard the website selling in that category have basically run out. I put my hands up. I visited a factory last year in China looking at it seriously. I think a lot of people do because they don't they think, oh, there'll be a lot of money in that category, which I'm sure that there is. But the problem is, is who you come up against, isn't it? 
you know. Uh, who was it telling me the other day? Uh, it was a private conversation, so I can't share information. All I do know is that there was something about someone was in the sex industry doing really well on Amazon, but then people would just come along and uh, basically obliterated the market, you know, because of the nature of being um, uh, lack of ethics and stuff. So it kind of destroyed the company in 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 the way that it won itself you know do you through. think there's more black hat or or like activity in sex toys versus like supplements no no there, there's pure evil in supplements there's some really <laughs> lovely people let me, let me reframe that but i tell you what that is a proper dog fight there is some yeah. you know when we're talking about life's ethics and stuff we are scraping the barrel with some of those people it's yeah. just some of the worst scumbags in the world operate in that category a long time alongside really amazingly great people as well so just to be clear that not everyone who sells yeah. supplements I mean, is just, bad. right yeah. like just because you're selling sex toys doesn't mean meaning like is it any is it any more cutthroat category than any other category on amazon i don't know because i don't never really met that many people that go right. hey i sell dildos do you know what right. I mean? <laughs> no i mean i know people don't talk about their products on amazon right. but yeah but now have you ever gone to a conference like you've gone to silicon what do you do yeah well i sell these kind of things that you stick up your backside no. you just it, it's not a conversation no, but, um, i i do know i do know some sellers that have gone to like um that have gone to like trade shows in the in the in the sex toy world like in the us to, to look at products wholesale and 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 private label and i i think i've sold some products in that category but um mm. i've uh i've uh i've not been myself okay right moving swiftly on before we get arrested yeah uh let's go to oh, i love this one and 100 percent agree with it check this out regarding the guy that gets rich in five years one of the tweets that you had on the cutting room floor was avoid people who got rich quickly they're just giving you their winning lottery ticket numbers mm. this is generally true of advice anyway which is it's back to scott adams systems not goals if you ask a specific person what worked for them very often it's just like they're reading out the exact set of things that work for them which may not be applicable for you they're just reading your their winning lottery ticket numbers it's a little glit there is something to be learned from them but you can't just take their exact circumstance and map it onto yours. The best founders I know, they listen and read to everyone, but then they ignore everybody <laughs> and they make up their own mind. They have their own internal model of how to apply things to their situation and they do not hesitate to discard information. If you survey enough people, all the advice will cancel to zero. So you do have to have your own point of view. And when something is set your way, you have to very quickly decide, is that true? Is that true outside of the context of what that person applied it in? Is it true in my context? And then do I want to apply it? You have to reject most advice, but you have to listen to and read enough of it to know what to reject and what to accept. Yeah. Even in this podcast, you should. Right. So basically saying there is about the advice and what you take on and I would say I avoid, I ignore, not ignore, I take people's advice, listen to it, but of that information, I'd use about 5%, 10%. Because from that information, there's some amazing stuff that comes back. Let me give you a little example of what this could be like. Think of Seller Sessions as a podcast, right? Mm -hmm. I think what we do is slightly different to a lot of people out there. If I said to people, I'm going to start a podcast, can you give me feedback? What should it be like? Do you know what would come back? Scott Volker, the amazing seller, because yeah. that's what people were used to. And they'll say, you should do it like this, and you should be doing questions that come in, and all the things. And that podcast, and that will have the intro music with guitars in, and most people will come back and say, you should do this, this, and this. And what will drop out the bottom would be the amazing seller part two. And that yeah. would make me in all inauthentic, and I would have no point of differentiation. Right. Right. Well, you know, the thing is also that generally a lot of times people don't know they want or need something until you present it to them. Right. Like people didn't people didn't re like there were taxis before Uber. Mm -hmm. People didn't people weren't like crying out for an Uber yeah. until Uber was created and people realized like, wow, I really need this in my in my life. Right. So mm -hmm. you, you ended up creating something different um that you wanted to create and then people are like oh okay now i need to listen to the seller sessions podcast um 
And so you're right. Like people generally don't necessarily know what they <laughs> what they want or need until until sometimes it's it's presented to them. Well, this is a Tim Ferriss rule, and I try and apply yeah. this to everything. Is he says look at what everyone else is doing and run the other way. And there's right. two things that can happen. You can either hit it out of the park or it will just fizzle out. So you've got to find out. Like I'd rather run left, as I call it, and go over there and have a spectacular foul, take my learnings for it and try something else. Then right. try and do something and it be exactly the same as everyone else. Scott Volker is great at what he does. I'm not Scott Volker. I can't do right. what he does. I haven't got the same personality. I don't have the same accent. I'm not from the same background. Right. Me mic mimicking what he does is inauthentic and it will just make me look like a me too product. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, I, I, you know, talking about that Tim Ferriss principle, like does that, I mean, a lot of people were running towards Amazon in 2013 and 14. If you did yeah. that, you did, you did, you generally, that was a good move. Right. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are still running towards Amazon. Is that, yeah. is that still a good move? Right. Yeah. Like, it's I point of differentiation, isn't it? It's like, I think, but the slight different with that thing is there is that you're selling a product on Amazon and as you learn, you adjust. Like this show now doesn't sound like show 001. This is 400 and something. I don't right. even count anymore, right? right? So this is completely different. Look at the format that we're doing because what happens is over time you maneuver and you find your feet, you find your setting. It's like the same with a product. It's like your, your first product is terrible generally because you don't know how to create products. And then you start with, just putting a badge on it, and then it goes into a box, yeah, from a poly bag to a box. Right. And then before you know it, you've got a mold, and then you've got a paint, and, and then do you see where I'm coming from? So suddenly right. it's like it, it is an ongoing development of trying to find what it is, but it does come back to like, you know, is ignoring most of the advice you get is, is I think, is right. I think you should. Obviously, don't ignore the the really good advice. Right. But you have to apply a filter. And if you don't right. apply a filter, you become everything to everyone. And you need to stand for something, right yeah. or wrong. And you have to live and die by what your um by what you do. And if and there are going to be times you fall on your sword. Absolutely. And, that's, and you have to own that as well. Yeah. And that's part of that's part of the process of becoming of becoming better. You know, you learn. Yeah. You know, it's it's the perspective of how do, how do you look at your mistakes? You know, do you yeah. look at them as a terrible thing, or do you look at them as like I had an opportunity to learn something and and uh, and better myself? Um, and you know, talking about listening to other people, um, going back to, to Derek Sivers, I've been listening to a lot. He's writing a, he's writing a book right now called um, uh, Hell Yes or No. Okay, yeah. and basically the the premise of the book is like somebody asks you to do something or you have an opportunity. If it's not a hell yes, it should be a no, right? Like yeah. you can say no to everything hmm. except the things that are hell yes and really focus on um, really focus on just a few a few things in your life. Hmm. Which is I think a, I think a good mindset. But I think you know, he 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 sort of puts that in a box with like that is the right time for that is when you're sort of overwhelmed with opportunity, right? Like he says, you know, people email him and say, um, like they want to apply to everything, right? But if you just finished college, you know, and you have like, if you just finished college and you have no opportunity and you get five things your way, then like, no, you should you should take on those opportunities and you should try different things, right? That's not the time to say it's either hell yes or no. But when you get to a certain point in your life of being busy and focusing, then at that point it should be either hell yes or no, right? So just like mm -hmm. use it in the right context. Yeah. What about... I like this, and this is probably fits you to a T. A calm mind, a fit body, and a house of love. Let's do it. Yep. The last tweet on the topic of working for the long term is that when you're finally wealthy, you'll realize that it wasn't what you were seeking in the first place. But that's for another day. That's a multi hour topic in and of itself. First of all, I thought it was a really clever way to end the whole thing because it disarms a whole set of people who'd say, well, yeah, what's the point of getting rich? <laughs> because there are a lot of people who just like the status signal, virtue signal against the idea of wealth creation or making money. So it was just a good way to disarm all of them. But it's also true in that the things that you really want in life, yes, money will solve all your money problems, but it doesn't get you everywhere. The first thing you'll realize when you've made a bunch of money is that you're still the same person. If you're happy, you're happy. If you're unhappy, you're unhappy. If you're calm and fulfilled and peaceful, you're still that same person. 
I know lots of very rich people who are extremely out of shape. I know lots of rich people who have really bad family lives. I know lots of rich people who are internally a mess. So I would lean on another tweet that I put out, which is actually, when I think back on it, I think it's my favorite tweet of mine. It's not necessarily the most insightful. It's not necessarily the most helpful. It's not even the one I think about the most, but I just, when I look at it, there's just such a certain truth in there that it just resonates. And that is that a calm mind, a fit body, and a house full of love. These things cannot be bought. They must be earned. Even if you have all the money in the world, you can't have those three things. Jeff Bezos still has to work out. He still has to work on his marriage or whatever his next relationship is. And his internal mental state is still going to be very much not controlled by external events. It's going to be based on how calm and peaceful he's inside. So I think those three things, your health, your mental health, and your close relationships are things that you have to cultivate and can probably bring you a lot more peace and happiness than any amount of money ever will. So that's what I meant. Now, how to get there is actually a tweet storm that I still need to put out. I've been working on it. I have probably 100 tweets on it. It's just very hard to say anything on the topic without getting attacked from 50 different directions, <laughs> especially these days on Twitter. Twitter proper, so I've been hesitant to do it because I want to target it for a very specific kind of person. There's a bunch of people who don't believe that working on your internal state is useful. They're too focused on the external. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. They should do that. And that's who the, how to get rich tweet storm is for. There's a bunch of people who believe that the only thing worth working on is complete liberation, like you become the Buddha. And they'll attack anything in the middle as being useless. That's fine too, but most people aren't there. So what I want to do is to create a tweet storm that is just very practical advice for everyday people who want to have a calmer internal state. Just a set of understandings, realizations, half truth. So look, I can go on there, but there's um, yeah. three, three key things. Go on, you kick off because I know this so, is this is where you're at. This is your cycle. So yeah, and you know this is why I love Naval, right? He goes on Joe Rogan, and the first kind of thing he talks about is like why his tweet storm and why why he's why he went viral, right? And he says and he says to Joe Rogan, you go to the you go to the circus, and like you see an elephant, and like it's pretty cool. It's like normal, right? You see an elephant and whatever. But then you see the elephant riding a unicycle. And like, that's really interesting. And what makes Naval really interesting is that not only is he this like super successful investor business guy, but then he's also this, what he calls, you know, this angel philosopher, right? He also has this complete other side, which is, which is, which is his life philosophies. And together it's the elephant riding the unicycle. Right. Which is kind of like, yeah, I strive. I strive to be the elephant riding the unicycle. Like I want to be successful in business, but I also want to be successful in all areas of my life. And, and to me, that's the elephant on, on the unicycle. So, you know, he talks about all these principles about how to make money and how to get rich. And then at the end, he says, but getting rich is like really like is getting rich is not the end game of life. Right. It's like he, he kind of cancels out everything he said, because ultimately getting rich is not going to make you happy. Um, and it goes back to the goes back to the thing that the best things in life are free, right? Mm -hmm. Love, your health, your family, your relationships, calm mind, fit body, all that stuff. You don't need to be wealthy in order in order to have. You're either focused on it and working on it and on a journey, or you're not. But all mm -hmm. those things and wealth alone or money alone, money will solve. Like you said, money will solve your money problems. Yeah, right? and sure. Life is easier uh, and life life is easier with money because it can help solve your money problems. But but, you know, I, I that the thing he said about Jeff Bezos resonates a lot with me because guess what? Jeff Bezos got to get up every day and he, he's got to do the same workout I have to do if he wants to stay fit. He's mm -hmm. got no he's got no advantage. Yeah, maybe he's got a trainer. Maybe he's got really cool machinery. He's still got to work out you know, 30 minutes or an hour a day if he wants to, you know, or, or several times a week if he wants to stay fit. I'm in the same boat. Jeff Bezos can't, he, Jeff, if Jeff Bezos wants to stay fit and healthy, he can't have cake every night for, for, for dinner, right? Mm -hmm. Like, just like me, right? Jeff Bezos still has to work on his relationships, still has to work on his mind. Yeah. He has problems. They're just magnified, right? Mm -hmm. His, his problems are his, the complexity of his problems is, I mean, think about right now, right? He's got to worry about 
warehouses and COVID and employees and, and the government right now is calling him to testify because uh, because a Wall Street Journal article was out about uh, Amazon employees stealing data from third party sellers to develop their own products, which Amazon has claimed they're not doing like his problems are just magnified because mm -hmm. of the position that he's in. So like that gives me like some awesome perspective, like, OK, Jeff Bezos doesn't have money problems, but he sure he sure as hell has to deal with a lot of the same shit I need to deal with uh, yeah. in, order, in order to have a successful life. Yeah, I think, you know, going back to the relationship things, I put um, I put put money aside. I don't I don't put a, for a better word for it, excuse the pun. I don't put a price on money because money to me is the byproduct of everything I do. Just the byproduct it isn't the product. It's the byproduct. And I knew a long time ago that money wouldn't make me happy. You have to be happy on the journey. Right. Um, but one of the things, and I still do to this day, I've been with my wife 25 years, and I'm happy every day to work on my marriage because that plays in a massive important role in my life for the equilibrium that I have. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think if you've got a happy household, it's so much easier to go out there. Look, the war's outside, right? I'm not saying it's a war, but, you know, you're running yep. businesses, enough stress going on. You've got a team to look after. You've got COVID-19. It goes back to if you've got a solid foundation at home, mm -hmm. that's your grassroots. You can build right. from that outside those front doors. That's where the battlefield is, you know, in, in some cases. And yeah. I think importance is friends that you have, the loyalty that you have, with your friends and just removing, making sure you, you where you can and if you can, is removing toxic people out of your yeah. life in and Absolutely. around you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're right in a sense, right? Like you go out, you go out there in the world and like maybe, yeah, it's a battle. Like the last place you want to have a battle is like in your own world, right? Mm -hmm. Like in your own, in your own house. And un unfortunately, um, unfortunately, a lot of people deal with that, I think, with their, whether it's with their kids or their parents or their or their spouse or their siblings or, or whatever it is, um, you know, it's the last place that you want to have a, you want to have a, a battle. Um, some of that I think is within your control. Sometimes some of it is, you know, you have external. to. Yeah. Some of it's external. And you have to make decisions, um, you know, to to end end things. You know, um, I was in a I was in a, a I'm divorced at my my first marriage and yep. uh, a year into my marriage, I wanted to leave, but I was too scared. Mm -hmm. uh, like, what if I don't find anybody else? What if like, you know, it's only going to get worse from here. Like all these, all these like future fears in, in our head that we need to, that we need to, uh, that we need to deal with. But um, I think going back to going back to the point, like, yeah, it's a lot easier to have, it's a lot easier to make good decisions uh, and do the things out there. Uh, externally, when you have a calm mind, when you have the support of the relationships around you, um, and that the best things in life are free, love, family, relationships, your health. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some of those, they, they are free, but they require work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think all of them require work. It's like your health, like you've worked on your health. I've got autoimmune disease. I mean, at this moment in time on a, on a daily basis, I have to deal with SIBO and I've got um, mold and I've also got Lyme disease, but I've got a very expensive US doctor that I wouldn't have been able to afford a couple of years ago to give me the protocol to get back to full health, you know, so mm -hmm. I have to deal with fatigue and stuff. And that was one of the thing, key things as well was having years ago in brain fog and only being able to work so many hours a day, taking care of your health makes you feel good it gives you peace of mind like with exercise if you can exercise you get the endorphin rush and it gives you the balance and sensibilities and that see, helps with your relationships you know if you're drinking alcohol every night you're not going to feel good when you wake up the next day that has an impact on your relationships your well-being and your perspective as well you know yeah absolutely and you know i think i think there's there's another factor um that we haven't spoken about which is like gratitude right like yes ha yeah. having having a having a deep sense of gratitude for and i think covid is i mean it's either it's either it's probably make you go one way or another right for some people hmm. maybe it's making them uh, angrier um and i think for others for me for sure it's brought in like more more gratitude into my life i now appreciate my health a lot yeah. more like i don't 
I don't take it for granted. Maybe I took maybe I took it for granted, but now like, you know, now I feel like if you're if you're safe in your home, like you should be you should be grateful. You have a shelter over your head. You have your health. Um, there are there are many people who would gladly replace their situation with your situation. Um, you know, I think I think think about that. If you're able to watch this online right now, if you have the technology, um, there are plenty of people around the world that would that would trade all their problems for your problems. Um, and I think having a sense of uh, a sense of gratitude for your relationships, for your family, for your health. Um, I was listening. I may have mentioned this before on uh, one of the podcasts. Um, Dr. Um, Aman, he's like a brain doctor. Um, he was on a interview with Ed uh, with Ed Milet, and he was talking about he was talking about relationships, and he was saying, you know, um, it, it, like he would have he would he would have a temper, or he would like think about having a temper, or like saying something, or whatever, because his wife keeps the cabinet doors open, right, in the kitchen. It's like a bad habit. And he could like be like, and he could get all upset and be like, "Hey, why do you leave the cabinet doors open?" But then he thinks about, "Would I rather have this person in the house, or would I rather not have this person in the house?" Yeah. And at the end of the day, he'd rather have his wife in the house. And he knows if he continuously has outbursts about her leaving the cabinet doors open, that that might lead to her not being in the house anymore, right? To leaving, right? And so, uh, I think having perspective, having gratitude, and you know. And allowing our thoughts to kind of come and like watch them over like a cloud and just like pass by. Don't react to every thought that you have because it's just like your ego trying to get at you, right? It's these these forces within your head that are that you shouldn't always necessarily uh, 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 you shouldn't always not every thought you have is a good one. Most of our thoughts are most, most yeah, they're not most of them are not good thoughts. So yeah, it depends on your mindset. You know? Yes, most of our thoughts are a mental loop that we think over and over and over again. They're not new new ideas. They're the things we think about every every single day. And sometimes uh, I was doing this meditation. Uh, somebody did it online. I was doing this meditation, and at one point in the meditation, he was like, "What thought are you thinking right now? Like you're in a you're in a you're imagine yourself sitting in a room. You're watching uh, a big screen that's blue, and there's a cloud with your thought on it. And just like just watch it pass by. Like don't accept every thought you have to be like something you need to immediately say out loud or immediately take action by let's let some things go because they're not serving you yeah yeah i mean we've still got this thing with mental health and stuff um probably shouldn't say this on the show but i had a family member this week who tried to commit suicide and wow. she, she survived but um yeah so we've been dealing with that in at home so it, you have to practice gratitude and you know that sometimes when you see stuff coming uh, with a build up to stuff and it comes back to your health your mental health your well-being and all those kind of things so when someone gets to that stage it's um it's a really tough jam that people obviously get to and ideally is is the prevention rather than the cure is to to avoid getting to that stage but um yeah you know you think is there's some more things that you can do and but um yeah there's there's a lot of stuff going on out in the world and this is why i think people Having that fundamental thing, you know, don't chase money. Look at your relationships, look at your friendships, and just make sure that you've got the right people around you is the key thing. And, and you know, it comes down to, and it, it is so difficult, it comes down to those small daily habits. Like, I meditate, hmm. but but I struggle with it so much. Like, finding those 20 minutes, because um, finding those 20 minutes to close my eyes and do it is like a battle every day. And I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily do it every day. I, I try to, um, but it's, it's a battle. And like, and I, I always feel great after, but why is it so hard to get myself to, to sit for 20 minutes, right. And close my eyes, but we live in a distracted, hmm. distracted world. But, but, but I, the, the way I can get myself to do it is I know that it's these small da daily things that lead to kind of like the mm. long-term wins that will lead to me not getting into a state where where you know i want to be suicidal or will 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 lead will just lead me to live a happier more fulfilled life um you know and i think going back to to naval is leading a happier more, more fulfilled life is um not just about being being rich um i follow jesse etzler who says 
you know, he's like, I met plenty of people in, in my life that are that are rich. And he's like, they're not successful. They're just rich. Hmm. Right. Like they're just rich, but they're not successful because it's the overweight guy who's going to have a heart attack at 60. Like that guy's miserable. Not, yeah. That miserable, bad relationships. That guy is not successful. Um, now it's not, it's also not to downplay being rich, being, being rich is great, but I think you want to focus on, I think you don't want to lose focus on all the other things just yeah. in, in the sacrifice of being rich. Exactly. You could pursue, you could basically, and I did it as well with uh, early startup, you have investors and stuff and you're, you're there to lead the line and you're working seven days a week. It can have a tremendous impact on your family. Them long hours have a tremendous impact on your health as well and you when you're younger you're like well you know you use all the energy that you have and you're like, what do you mean you rest i'll do 100 hours a week or you know and, you, and it's non-sustainable and it's as you get older and, and burning out and burning out i remember a time the one thing that saved me from going over the edge is I, one after christmas we went over to the the apartment this is about 2010 and just going away getting away from the winter and spending a week at the apartment in Tenerife where it was sunny and sit by the pool, that saved me from getting to a stage of having a full-on breakdown, I think. That was that precursor to them. If I didn't get on that flight, I don't know where I would have gone from now. And I think this is what people have to understand as well. There's, you can get there, and it's the Gary thing, v thing. It's about patience, right? Mm -hmm. you get there yeah. eventually, but you do have to rest. You have to do these things. Well, and, and when the boss says, you know, somebody who tells you how they got rich quickly, like they're just giving you their lotto, their lotto ticket, but mm -hmm. that, that's already been played, right? Like that lotto ticket is not going to win. It's not going to win again. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, yeah, I think it's patience, gratitude, um, and, and habits that are kind of the, the secrets. Yeah, I don't think people realize with um, – with gratitude i think that's because we're, we're in a world where there's a lot of people are self like self-entitled i can't stand that characteristic in people when they're entitled people and i tend to pick them up on it but i think um the when you show someone is like to to have affirmations to show gratitude on a daily basis the change in them people are incredible like because they can they physically and it's something that can happen quite quickly by saying, you know, writing a, a journal or doing something in the morning, the first day can make tremendous impact. You know, like normally with stuff like exercise, you want to lose weight, you want to get six pack. It's a long road, right? Yeah. So you see these small changes. You might first week because you're losing water weight, you lose the weight, but then the real fat comes off half a pound a week and it's about dedication stuff. With gratitude and practicing that, the impact and the significance of that can happen on day one. Mm-hmm. And, but I think what happens is people forget to do it, get on with their life, and they lose their daily habits and go back to the old ones. Yeah. And, you know, um, I think that's all of us as humans. It's like against our human nature. Like our human nature goes towards survival and comfort. Mm -hmm. And so survival and comfort is sitting on the couch watching Netflix while eating pizza. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I think it is – I think you do need some external things to hold you accountable. So this, this sheet – um, this sheet that I do daily, um, yeah. me and another guy, we send the sheet to each other at the end of the day. We send a picture of the sheet to each other at the end of the day every day um, because it's another level of accountability beyond just me. Like I know that I'm going to be embarrassed mm -hmm. if uh, if none of the things that I set out to do during the day, uh, mm -hmm. if I've not done them. And not only, and if it's one day, it's one thing, but if I send it to him two or three days in a row, it's like, why am I fucking up so much? Why am I not doing the things that, that I want to be doing? And so it's, it's using these using the forces that we can like accountability and relationships and for whatever, whatever it is, it's checking a box is making me exercise. So mm -hmm. if that's the case, if that's the accountability I need, then I'm going to, then I'm going to do something that makes me happy to be able to do it and then check the box. And that's, and checking the box is more motivating than like whatever my health might be in, in five years down the road, because I did this habit every single day, checking the box is more immediately rewarding than, mm -hmm than anything else so i, I want to check the box yeah uh, 
I'm just going to mention some comments here in the feed. Sorry, just falling a bit behind. Anna says, yes, we do need family time, referencing what we're saying about balance earlier on. Owen says, Lee Ran, you've inspired me to start meditating, and I'm only up to 10 minutes, but I'm really impressed of how it sets me up for the day, and thank you for that. Uh, Joe says, gratitude is the attitude and seals with God. Uh, Tiffany says, I, f I knew I felt a kindred spirit with you, Danny. I have Lyme too. You're both awesome dudes. I admire you both. Thank you, Tiff. We love you, the fact that you, you tune in every day and support the show. Uh, who else have we got here? And uh, Alan, him, uh, I would say as far as, as far as meditation, uh, first of all, only up to 10 minutes is like 10 minutes of meditation is great. It's better, it's better than zero. Um, and the other thing is like, don't judge the meditation. Like if you were distracted, if you couldn't do it or whatever, like never go back and judge a meditation session. Like it is, it is what it is. You go on, you go on to the next one. Um, and there is no Holy grail of like getting to 20 minutes. I, I happen to do 20 minutes because I learned uh, transcendental meditation, which is like 20 minutes. It's mantra based, super easy, um, mm -hmm. in terms of getting to 20 minutes, but don't judge a meditation. The fact that you're doing it is is all that you should judge yeah uh Quasim says money doesn't get you everywhere um tiff says this is priceless advice so many uh chase money and wonder why they end up miserable now elchins we, we, we're going to do one last you, you up for requests lee yeah. we don't normally yeah. do requests yeah but we've got one here please play group search for consensus that boy has got good taste. Let me see if we can find that. And then we'll end the show on that because I think we're coming up to about the hour mark. Yep. Let me see if I can find it. I think that's one of the newer ones, isn't it? It's from, from this year rather than from the uh, original tweet storm. Let's have a look. Yeah, this come out on the 24th of March. It's quite a new one. Yep. It's a quite a short one. Let me just find it. Bring this back. Very fought over. When we say truth, the biggest problem we're going to run into is that what society wants for you is not what's always good for you. Society is the largest group, and groups search for consensus. Individuals search for truth. It is not acceptable for society to tell you the truth on many things. There are many things society throws out all day long that if you're a smart and critical thinking person that you disbelieve but you're forced to go along with it, even though deep down, you know, it's not true. Money isn't going to make you happy. That's a society truth. That's not an individual truth. Look at all the individuals trying to make money deep down. They know that yes, money will get rid of a lot of sources of unhappiness and at least put it to the point where happiness is then under my control. It's my choice as opposed to being inflicted upon me externally. That is just one of a billion lies society tells you. Another lie society tells you is that you send your kids to school for education. No, they get an hour a day of education. They get indoctrination. They get taught at the speed of the slowest student. They get taught mostly subjects that are irrelevant or obsolete. Education is a combination of a small bit of education, a large dose of socialization, a large dose of compliance training, a massive dose of babysitting, which is helpful for parents who can't take care of the kids at home. Also, it keeps young troublemakers off the streets, especially at the teenage level who might be going out and committing crime and causing problems or getting in trouble. So school does a lot of things, but education is just a very tiny piece of it as all the homeschooling stats clearly show. And even the unschooling stats are starting to show. Society does not just tell you things that are false. It programs you to beat yourself up when you cross one of these boundaries, when you transgress against society's truths. A classic example of that is guilt. Guilt is society's voice speaking in your head. Guilt is society programming you so effectively that you are your own warden. So truth seeking is a very hard business because you essentially have to, with deep conviction, understand things that you are told are wrong all day long. That's powerful. Yes. Yeah. Um, Facing the truth and then having to stand up to other people to, to talk about those truths as well. I mean, for me, school. Like what you said there, an hour a day. I think this whole pandemic thing is ch no, is a global change for schooling. Once everyone worked out this horseshit about sending someone to school for eight hours, they're getting one hour's worth of education. They're getting some compliance training, right? right? They had their lunch hours, there's the breaks, and all these private schools and stuff. How are they going to start to justify what they're charging 
in, mm. in realistic terms of what's going on out there. So I think if one good thing could come out of this pandemic, we need to really reshape this schooling system and abolish it and start again for a 21st century and, from the grassroots. And look, you know, kind of like um, kind of like he tweeted recently about like unnecessary meetings and commute, right? Like mm. business is still going on around the world without face to face, uh, without face to face meetings with with Zoom, with, you know, we're, business is going to change as a result of of what's uh of of what's going on too um so i think i think COVID is accelerating you know a lot of what a lot of what would happen maybe five or ten years from now um like you know universities right like they've been operating like studying studying online and uh kids studying from home on on zoom and and um uh, I think there will be a lot of changes as a result, and yeah, it's it's being accelerated now. But I, I agree as far as like seeking your own truth, um, and society has its own agenda hmm. to to tell you what uh, kind of like to tell but, you what, what the truth should be. Yeah, but the problem you've got is then you in a situation when you know the truth and you accept the truth, and then you try and say, articulate that to people around you who don't want to buy into that truth, that makes it very difficult for that person to live their yeah. life in and around their friends. So they then have to go and look, and if it's your family as well, and if you're younger right. and you live at home, it makes it very difficult to you tr you're forced to live someone else's truth. Yeah. It comes back to that. And that I would world. imagine, I would imagine the vow will tell you then that those are not your, those are not the peer group you should be, uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you should be spending time with, uh, yeah. you know, but, um, yeah, I think I think it's essentially you got to think for yourself is is uh, is what he's saying. And um, yeah, like society tells, you know, you know it's interesting because he says at the end of the day, he says wealth is in one thing. He says, you know, like chasing wealth is not what you should do. But mm -hmm. then there are certain things society tells you, like money doesn't bring you happiness. And, and in some ways it can. So it's kind of interesting to hear his two sort of parallel uh, thoughts around that. But yeah, sure. Money can bring you money can bring you happiness. It's just that it shouldn't be the only thing that brings you happiness. Well, look at what money's managed to do from us from humble beginnings. Like I could be living in a council flat, uh, flat in uh, in Hackney now or live where I live. And because of that, my my mental health is in a far better place. Right. A lot of people that are cooped up on a, in a tower block. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one thing it's done there is, and I don't consider myself rich, uh, but I'm very wealthy in my mind. I put it that way. Um, but yeah, it's it's afforded me to put myself into isolation, so my mental health is good, and I can operate on a daily basis and be appreciative of everything I have. Absolutely. Yes. Goes back to uh, to gratitude. Indeed. Right. Let's sign off. Anything you want to part part with? Anything you want? Any final wise words for the uh, um, no the sessions family out there? No, I think it's been. Uh, I think this has been really great. Um, I've been uh, enjoying it. it. Looks like there's a lot of uh, a lot of nice uh, comments. So uh, appreciate that. And um, you know, I think this is a good addition, COVID or not COVID. You know, um, I think I think bringing an element of mindset into um, into the podcast is uh, is a great addition. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for giving up your time on a weekly basis. Yeah, fine. So, right, sign off. I'll see you again 4 p.m. tomorrow. Stay home, stay safe. Much love. Take care. See you later, Liren. I'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.